Good morning from New York. My name is Salman Ravala, and welcome to the Horaces Global Meeting for 2022. We're excited to have you join our program and our panel on developing nations facing political and economic uncertainty. Businesses do not like uncertainty, but in equality, weak political institutions, a corrupt ruling class, and environmental and infrastructure challenges persist, especially in developing nations, and most certainly in develop- developed nations as well. What are the solutions that businesses can influence and what better guidance might be given by global institutions like the IMF or the World Bank to whom developing nations often turn to? How can developing nations and economies diversify away from agriculture, fuels and mining that are often exploited or sold or sanctioned to sanctioned nations? What is the role of public markets and exchanges, especially with regards to improving governance and transparency? And how can the international community and especially businesses demonstrate that there is a premium on the integrity of the state and on capacity building after COVID and the Ukraine debacle? We're going to explore all of this and much more today with our panel. We have an exciting lineup of speakers from around the world that I'm very excited to present with. Uh, We have Shay Gopal, who is the permanent representative of the International Organization of Employers, the IOE, who's bringing today the voices of businesses large and small to the United Nations table in order to reach the 2030 Agenda SDG goals. We also have Nandini Sukumar joining us from London, who is the Chief Executive Officer of the World Federation of Exchanges in the United Kingdom. And shortly we'll hear from Arun Sharma, who is based in the United States and the President of Grove Pike Associates. Let's begin with our first speaker today, uh, Ambassador Shea Gopal, who again is from New York City. Uh, You've heard a little bit about the introduction of the topic. How would you see uh, this play out in an ideal scenario from your vantage point, especially working with businesses of all sizes and focused on an international organization or presenting to or having a seat at the table at the largest international organization here, the United Nations. Welcome. Thank you for being here. Thanks for that nice introduction and good morning, good afternoon, good evening to everyone. And and I'm delighted to be here. Um, We have a tough topic to discuss, you know, uh, the political and economic um, challenges right now for all countries throughout the world are are not small. And um, just as you had mentioned, I represent an organization that deals with and represents the voice of business, some 50 million companies throughout the world. And we have employer, what we call associations, business associations, federations in 150 countries. So you can imagine that the challenges, while we can say there are a lot of global challenges that we have, it really depends on each country as well, depending on what's there in their economy, what are their natural resources, what is the situation in political stability, et cetera. But I represent employers who are interested, if we're looking at the sustainable development goals, if we're looking at really um, development issues, we focus around creating jobs. If you want uh, to feed a family, get the people in the family having jobs. And the job market is tough. Uh, In many countries, it very much, um, you know, we want businesses to flourish, However, we um, recently did a study on least developed countries, what we call the LDCs. And there are some 46 countries within the UN system that are um, registered or categorized as least developed. And we have 26 employers federations throughout the world 
um, in those countries. And in our study, we came up with some really basic things that companies need, large and small, in order to flourish and to create more decent jobs. And enabling business environment means being able to set up a business, not with in some countries, it takes 300 days to set up a business. You want to move quickly. And a big issue in many of the developing countries is what we call informality. These are companies that are in the informal sector. They're often very small, but they are not registered. They are not paying taxes. They are not necessarily giving people the benefits, um, social, you know, the social contract and social benefits that they should. So addressing the informal sector, trying to set up, um, looking at infrastructure. And there I rely on what we call the digital divide, being able to give people access to the internet. But also once you give them access and you give them computers, giving the, them the education, the digital skills that are required in order to use some of this information. In the least developed countries, only 31% of males have access to the internet and women only 19%. So how do we get more women access? How do we get women, and a lot of this is domestic work at home, informal sector, selling things on the street. Women are entrepreneurs. They want to be able to set up businesses. But again, you need good governance. You need this whole area of corruption, political stability, in order for businesses to flour and to um, really set up um, uh, uh, businesses. The last thing I would say is you can't do it alone. Public-private partnerships are key. We need the IMF, we need the World Bank, we need the UN, but we need them to be also listening to business. And that's why that's the challenge of my work. I've just set up a uh, a, uh, a partnership with Microsoft, with um, IOE and the UN to really develop some of the skills um, that are required in some of these least developed countries through our employers' federations. So maybe I'll stop there and give the floor to my other colleagues to see how we can um, address all these important challenges. So glad you mentioned public-private partnerships and, uh, you know, the need from my angle as an attorney, uh, a need to systemize, uh, certainly, but also create uniformity because there can be a copy paste model that is successful in a number of other uh, developed nations, most certainly, but also developing emerging markets. So thank you for your comments. I'm sure we'll have a lot more to talk about. Uh, let's hear from uh, Nandini, who's joining us from London once again, and is the CEO of the World Federation of Exchanges. Welcome, and uh, tell us what's on your mind today. Thank you. I mean, it was uh, thanks for the welcome, and thank you for that introduction. I'm really pleased um, that I'm going after Shay because she said a lot of things um, that I support and corroborate, and perhaps will be able to give you a sense. Uh, of from a public market angle. So my job, as, as it says on, on my title, uh, I lead the World Federation of Exchanges, where the trade body, the industry body for exchanges and CCPs collectively called market infrastructures around the world. So in essence, um, we represent public markets. And if you asked me one thing, one answer that I would give you in response to the question, which is how do you develop how do you develop? How do you bring greater prosperity? How do you bring you know, more jobs? How do you lift people out of poverty? I would say to you that having a vibrant, thriving public market is absolutely essential. And this is particularly the case. I mean, the WFE is a global organization. So our membership, in fact, looks very similar to the UN. Uh, you know, I always say that under N, in the name of, in our membership, we have NASDAQ, we have the Nairobi Stock Exchange, you know, we have the New York Stock Exchange, we have the National Stock Exchange of India, we have the New Zealand Stock Exchange. So that gives you a, a sense of the breadth um, of the markets, of markets around the world. In emerging and developing markets, and 50%, 50% of my members come from developing or emerging markets, uh, the single greatest priority we can all focus on is developing 
the exchange or developing those public markets. And developing those public markets will nurture the economy. So all those things that Shay was talking about, which I absolutely uh, support, how do we get more women to work? How do we lift people out of poverty? Public markets have a role, have a fundamental role uh, to play. It isn't enough, I mean, to say public markets have a role. We have to address how they can play a role. The fundamental aspect, I mean, the market exists um, to transfer to transfer risk, but it exists to raise capital, to redistribute, if you like, uh, wealth. So they're, they're open. Public markets are open. So if you've got, and, and you're seeing it, especially in emerging and developing markets, if you've got you know, $2 in your pocket, um, and you can find someone, you can find a broker, you can buy or sell and, you know, uh, create wealth. The reality, though, is that it's very unlikely because for those, for those seminal reasons that Shay mentioned, because the structural impediments um, are great. So the question from, the question that I live and that I work on every day with our mm-hmm. members around the world, um, the question that exchanges uh, seek to address every day is how can we make public markets exchanges a force for societal good? How how can we work with government, with the private sector, with industry, with organizations uh, such as Shea uh, to use public markets to mobilize capital, to transform the lives uh, of people? If you look, we've come out of the last, I mean, we're coming out of the last two years uh, of an unprecedented time. And if you look around, I mean, I think one thing is clear, uh, apart from Ukraine and all the, all the terrible things that are happening, mm-hmm. uh, more people will be in poverty at the end of the pandemic than there were going in, right? So we are entering, I mean, the pandemic has been bad for, like terrible for a lot of people and for the people who can afford it least. So the question we all need to ask is, how can we mobilize capital through transparent, accountable, global mechanisms uh, that we can harness? And there's a whole industry around microfinance. The World Bank and the IMF exist you know, to offer some of those funding mechanisms. Exchanges are the fundamental you know, financing mechanism. And there have been really very interesting um, models of you know, tapping into retail investors coming into the market. There's a there's a bond in um, very successful bond uh, in on the Nairobi Stock Exchange, and everyone talks about it. But basically, um, it was a post office bond. So you could, you know, you, you so you had a little bit of money if you were a casual worker. Uh, you could still invest, and that investment, you know, hopefully would grow. So you have it's a it's a it's a mechanism to alleviate poverty. Throughout the crisis, throughout the pandemic, markets remained open just to, to, to perform their fundamental role, which is to raise capital. So if you're a company, you know, if you're a small business, if you're a big business, if you're an unlisted business, you know, one of Shea's members, uh, coming to a stock market uh, will enable you to grow. You know, it will enable you to hire. It will enable you, you know, to expand your business uh, and all the virtuous consequences uh, that come from that. So let me pause at this oh. moment. Um, and we, I see we have our fourth uh, speaker joining us. Welcome. Um, back to you. Welcome, Aaron. Uh, well, let, let's, uh, before we jump on, I, I want you for our audience, because again, this is our global meeting and we have a large number of people that are joining and may follow this online uh, and, and that come from a variety of different backgrounds, including diverse backgrounds. I want you to define for us public markets, please, because others may not know what that is. Uh, And tell us in in maybe 30 seconds or so what your organization does. You mentioned some of the members, but just for clarification for our audience uh, that may watch this later, uh, we want to communicate. And I, I, as a moderator, want to ensure that our knowledge that all of you are sharing with all of your skill sets is is one uh, available, but also uh, understood clearly so people can take action in their local geographies. So again, I'm sorry, tell us a little bit about what public markets are and the the mission of the World Federation of Exchanges. Public markets are exchanges. 
you know so uh, i say exchanges as opposed to stock exchanges because exchanges exist you know in many forms but typically in an emerging or in a uh, frontier market you start with a stock exchange uh, and that exchange uh, lists companies so if you're a company you know a family run company or a company that has so far relied on bank uh, funding uh, to grow and finance yourself you can come to the exchange and you can list um and suddenly that gives you a currency uh, it gives you investors it gives you exposure you know all those great things so when i'm talking about public markets i'm talking specifically about exchanges exchanges Wonderful. of course beyond stock exchanges you have derivatives exchanges they come later typically in an emerging or a frontier markets life so we call it the sequencing we call it sequencing you start usually you start with the bond market they are typically not public markets you have few bond exchanges but then you set up a stock exchange typically that requires the support of the government and the state because it's a it's a set of conditions that contribute to creating a stock exchange the stock exchange grows um it does its thing it does what it's meant to do uh, which is support the investment in the country acts as a channel for inward capital flow and investment uh, as well as you know improving conditions for the economy and then you can move on to the derivatives market where you have a more sophisticated um a market where people you know hedge risk mitigate risk transfer risk um etc thank you for that i i think that's very you asked me what we did uh so we are the industry group uh we advocate on behalf of our members and we work actively to develop markets with exchanges uh, around the world wonderful and i i asked that specifically because there are if we're talking about emerging markets there may be groups that are ready to be a part of the ioe for example shays group uh or your exchange that may need more information so i want to make that information accessible most certainly and i want to invite them to at least explore learning about these organizations thank you very much for that uh arun sharma joining us from the united states as well welcome sir uh president of growth pike associates we have been talking a bit about the challenges in uh, the creation of jobs being key but businesses also need to be felt heard especially by international organizations certain structural impediments in place uh certain fixes and a need for uniformity tell us what's on your mind and tell us briefly what growth pike associates does and welcome again thank you firstly apologies for the delayed entry i had uh, technical issues i am currently in mumbai on a work trip um a first trip post covid uh, so as growth pike associates really i represent myself uh, <clears throat> having stepped down on my role as chief investment officer of the ifc uh, after 29 years uh, and i now serve about half my time as a senior advisor to the ifc globally and i'm here on ifc work in asia and this trip uh, and it was very interesting uh, to hear about the world federation of exchanges i did a lot of work over the years in setting up exchanges in number of ifc markets as mm-hmm. ifc has been a pioneer in that space for uh, uh, i think several decades now it's we don't do as much of that as we used to because we're not needed as much but uh, certainly it's very fundamental to the financial infrastructure of a country so in addition to my work at the ifc i spend the other half of my time with two or three large uh, global corporations uh, i spend a little bit of time with mastercard uh, i spend some time with standard chartered in the digital finance space and uh, i spend uh, the balance of my time with uh, the european bank rabo bank uh, on climate issues uh, specifically creating blended finance solutions for uh, the more difficult climate issues around uh, uh, carbon credits and uh, reforestation land rehabilitation and agribusiness so so that's uh, what keeps me busy <clears throat> uh, and uh, uh, over the years uh, <clears throat> you know all these issues have been germane to you know what i do and uh, i still haven't got tired of uh, flying around the world in in my work so i continue to do that and that's why i'm here uh, in mumbai today working on ifc repositioning uh, in the asian market as uh, 
the market struggle with, you know, the issues that you just outlined with geopolitical uncertainty, the, the rise in uh, rise in inflation, the economic consequences of the pandemic, uh, huge indebtedness in multiple countries, uh, the crisis in neighboring Sri Lanka from here. And there's too many, too many to go on. So, yeah, it's, it's a it's a you know a challenging world, and uh, the contrarian role of my organization is uh, ever more in demand. So, still keeping me busy despite my efforts to retire, where I've completely <laughs> failed. <laughs> Thank you. Well, look, one one never retires uh, after service in an international organization. So, I I, uh, I I wish you good health and continued service to 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 developing nations developed nations uh i want to go back to a comment nandini made which is uh, there are excellent models in place if there are excellent models in place and i know this sounds like a very naive question why are there challenges that continue to exist and i know we've talked a little bit about these structural impediments We've explored the idea of PPPs in place and even organizations like the IFC or the World Bank that may condition certain loans based upon um, sort of implementation of some of these policies, right? Uh, If there are excellent models, what are the challenges and how do we get, get in, in our scenario, developed, excuse me, developing nations to comply? What's the compliance issue here, the failure to comply issue? Anybody, and yeah, I'm opening this up now. Yeah, it's, it's a, you know, it's a question dear to my heart, and I'm happy to answer in the most non-politically politically incorrect way. Uh, you know, the difference between a developed and a developing country, I've worked now over 50 countries and <clears throat> my career at the IFC, is really incumbent upon the willingness of the con- developing country and and its peoples, and I, and then that I include right from the lowest to the highest, from the prime minister down to the janitor, as I, as I like to call it, in in really willing to work, play by the rules and work for the collective interest. If you, I mean, it's a very broad generalization, but you can test it against any 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 scenario. The difference between any developing country and a developed country is that. There is a general willingness and an ability of the general populace to play by the rules, uh, whether it's the rules of your community, your condo association, at, or the rules of civic society on uh, on how to treat a public park, a natural resource, or the rules of PPPs and uh, and construction of uh, you know providing essentially what you're contracted to provide or you know, staying with that concession agreement for the life of the contract. So I think that's a very broad generalization, but that's what it is. And uh, again, I'm being politically incorrect, but I think it's not the time for, uh, uh, you know, given the situation to be uh, totally nuanced. The fact is that uh, it's terribly difficult, despite the best models and the best aid, to help people who don't want to help themselves. So if you see the history of what I call IFC graduates, it's those countries who wanted to help themselves who graduated, Japan, you know, Portugal, Chile, Malaysia, Korea. All mm. these countries have one thing in common. They wanted to help themselves. They used the IFC and, and all the support and all the models to actually get ahead because they wanted to. And they, they configured the political and the social will to use those capabilities that were delivered to them in the right way and in an effective way. And uh, we have a number of other countries, I don't want to go into all those details, who have just not been able to do that and uh, keep my organization in business when we should have been out of work actually many years ago. Thank you. Hmm. I appreciate the openness. This is a conversation, certainly with me moderating, where where, uh, we want to have open dialogue because all of our intentions and the intention of everybody in the audience is to try and resolve uh, the issues that we're talking about, right? So thank you for that. Others, comments? Nandini, uh, Shay, comments on that? I, I'd just like to raise just one or two issues. I'm coming from a different perspective. Um, when I said that we did the, our study on these LDCs, access to finance is probably one of the most important 
issues. Mm -hmm. A lot of these, particularly women who would like to start, uh, you know, with their startups and their SMEs <laughs> have really struggled to be able to have any sort of um, financing. And we know that these countries are high risk, given, as Arun said, there are a lot of challenges, political instability. We were saying poor governance, corruption, et cetera. But we need to start somewhere. Um, I'd like to also raise that the UN has a group called Financing for Development. It's a group that was set up with a lot of large banks, including uh, all the big names and MasterCard. And they're looking at blended finance, social uh, impact funds, bonds, COVID bonds, etc. I think there's a lot that's happening in this area. I think one of the struggles in international organizations is understanding the private sector the terminology, how they work, what this is all about. I think there's a huge knowledge gap here. As you know, in the past, the UN, it was all about what we call ODA, official development assistance. And the wealthy countries had a percentage of their economy that should have been given to like the likes in the UK of um, you know, their aid development agencies differed in the United States. It's called USAID, et cetera. Countries highly depend on that. That's how they were trying to move out of poverty. But that's the old method. Today, we need to be really stop thinking about development aid and thinking about how do we create jobs? How do we get people to sustain and to really move themselves out of poverty. And I'd like to add last, last point is policies matter. Our organization represents these employers at the local level that try to discuss with their governments like CII in, in India or um, uh, you know, MEDEF in France. And they're negotiating on a daily basis with governments and the social partners, which is, includes the unions, and um, they have this social dialogue. But it's important, and these are tough, tough negotiations that need to go on. But we need to start, if we want to reach the SDGs, I keep on saying we need systems change. These are long-term solutions, but we need to start. We have eight years left. We need to be changing some of our policies. We need to be looking at this and seeing how we bring the public and the private together to really work around some of these tough issues to reach the SDGs. And I'll just stop there. Thank you. Thank you. That's a great place for me to come in, Shay, um, as you talk about access to finance. From an exchange perspective, you need a certain set of factors or certain st structure in place to create an exchange. Um, and that those structures are fundamental. You need good regulatory regime. You need a supportive government. You need, you know, a central bank. Uh, many in emerging and in emerging markets uh, often you know, the exchange will come out of the central bank, you know, because that is the initial regulatory organization. But then you also need to be doing other things, you know, going back to Shea Seminole's point about policy and the policy leaders. So you need an enabling environment. That enabling environment needs to needs to have multiple policy levers. It needs to have it needs to be policy levers, first of all, you know, uh, where people where people are able to save. Um, you need to remove taxes on trading. You need to support a local. You need to nurture a local brokerage community. You need to you need to nurture a local domestic fund management community. You need to have policies, uh, taxation, and otherwise from the government that encourage um, the market structure uh, of a nation of an economy to thrive. And it's not particularly easy. Um, but it can be done, and every every nation, you know, developing or LDC or frontier, to the to the largest, everyone has an exchange in their toolbox. Mm. Uh, it's either aspirational um, or it's in progress. There are more exchanges now than there were you know, 50 years ago, which gives me hope, um, and it gives us many more members. But to have an exchange, people always say, "Oh, we'll create an exchange." Um, you need to have a set of enabling factors in place, uh, some of which I've mentioned. And you need to then tackle um, other things, softer things like education. You know, you need to say, for example, there are lots of fascinating uh, 
academic literature, a lot of work around, you know, how to mobilize household savings, domestic savings, and put it into, you know, an exchange or into a public market uh, as a vehicle, you know, um, to, to, to transform or to lever up those savings uh, where you would end, etc. But that's, that's in effect, um, what you need to create an exchange. And we would say everyone, every government in the world knows the value of creating an exchange. And, you know, I'm really pleased to be on this panel with uh, Arun. I agree the IFC has been a pioneer in this place, uh, in the space. Um, there sometimes feels, and I obviously live this, um, a feeling like the government or the state or the regulator says, well, here's an exchange, now go and do your thing. Um, and it, it doesn't, you know, you can't just plop an exchange down and say, good luck. You need to create that enabling environment around it with policy leaders. Wonderful. Thank you. If there's one takeaway you want our audience to um, sort of internalize and absorb, what would that be in terms of uh, the ask? And the the ask is to change behavior or to implement something. What would that one thing be? Uh, uh, And obviously, we've got a diverse uh, audience uh, with folks uh, in government, in business, in the private sector, so a global ask from your vantage point, from your role uh, in which you appear today. Let's start with you, Nandini, if, if that's all right. You can. Um, as a, I, My ask is simple, to the state, to the government, you know, think about how to nurture your exchange. Come forward with policy, with legislation that supports the levers to grow your market structure, because if you do that, you will inevitably uh, take the steps into economic growth that you are seeking. Thank you. And uh, Arun, thoughts on on an ask? Um... Well, it's more of, can you hear me? Uh, Yes, we can. Yes, we can. Okay. Yeah. So the, it's more of a wish than an ask. Uh, Sure. Uh, but it would be if uh, the if the you know the political authorities you know who in the end are the ultimate arbiters of the future of uh, most countries uh, uh, would would essentially put the national interest first as opposed to the narrow short term political interest. It's a very tough and somewhat impractical ask, but uh, I think you know without that uh, you know we can try as we might. Uh, you know, most of the efforts, uh, whether it's to build an exchange or whether it's to build capital markets or whether it's to build infrastructure or for social empowerment of the underprivileged, uh, you know, all that is is going to be very difficult, you know, because in the, as you know, the you look at the example of Sri Lanka, you look at the example of multiple other countries, you know, the populist policies, you're essentially borrowing as if uh, there was no tomorrow. And then, uh, you know, all this comes home to roost your back five, ten years. And, and it happens multiple times in multiple countries. And, uh, you know, and having a realistic sort of, uh, view of what really needs to be done and actually executing on it, even if it's painful for a little bit of, uh, you know, for a period, I think is, you know, is, is my aspiration, is my wish that, you know, more and more countries would do that. Uh, to really act in an in enlightened national interest. And you can give you so many examples, you can debate them. But but mm. they're there to see. Singapore is one. You know, Hong Kong is another. Thailand is to some degree another. Malaysia, certainly. And, and then there are other opposite ones, right? So multiple countries in Africa, resource-rich, small populations, huge land, you know, a lot of, lot of all the natural advantages. But look at the economic state. Uh, look at their social state, look at the social indicators, disaster. And and the reason for that is that uh, the the national interest is really subverted to the political, mm-hmm. immediate political interest. And unless, and you can have all the aid in the world, by the way, some of these, if you tabulate the aid mm-hmm. they've received over the years, the ODA, whatever, they're probably on a per capita basis, were probably the highest recipients over the years. But the outcome that, that has been achieved with that uh, you know, is is really pitiful to say the least. So, I think those countries, uh, you know, I would say more and more countries, if we could have a situation, a, an approach that takes national interest into mind, takes res- 
and brings that into responsible policies that favor the nation over the long term. You know, that would probably be the most uh, effective, I would say, intervention to improve the outcomes for that country, whether it's economic, social, and in the long term, you know, political as well. Thank you. And Ms. Gopal. I'm going to take a different view on this. I agree with both Arun and uh, Nadini that, that we have some real challenges here, but we have some opportunities. We have a youth bulge, what we call a youth dividend in a lot of countries, and particularly in Africa and Asia. We need to take advantage of this. If we want to move out of poverty, I think the biggest issue today is the digital divide. There's an opportunity here. If we could get the least developed countries where you have the most youth, who, by the way, in the advanced economies, these people may be taking care of you as you get older. As we look at the aging populations in some of these developed uh, economies, we need to start looking at how do we get access to these people and how do we get them the skills that they need in order to get jobs in what we might call green, uh, climate-friendly jobs, the caring economy. There's a huge opportunity here in the caring economy to get a lot of these young people's jobs. So I, while I know there are a lot of challenges and policies matter, but I think governments need to be looking at infrastructure. They need to be investing in them. We need to be looking at good governance, as I said earlier. But if you could bring this all together and bring the right parties together to the table, public and private, I think we could move the needle on this. But it really does take a lot of effort by international organizations, but also the private sector, to address that we have a problem and the governments, but how do we address it? We can only do this through innovation, you know, bringing the private sector together, bringing the financing together to move the needle on this so that we can move people out of poverty. I recall one of my first assignments was uh, an IFC project writing in my space, in the legal space, about mediation. And this was a research based on busting myths about mediation uh, for developing nations, because mediation was a relatively new concept, although it wasn't, uh, it wasn't like it hadn't been around. It was new to the business community, and uh, IFC and the American Bar Association put together a piece uh, in which I contributed, and the the amount of advocacy that was done to talk about busting these myths about mediation, and I look at that 10, 12, 15 years later, we're still struggling with the idea of promoting mediation in the court system, right? So we're, as we're talking about exchanges and businesses and, and, and creating jobs and developing an infrastructure, what excites me as an attorney is the opportunity uh, in the law and order space, and that's that's perhaps not the right term, but creating systems that allow businesses and individuals uh, to have access to justice, whatever that means to each of you. And courts are backlogged because of COVID. Um, and if mediation can be used to implement a faster, more accessible just system, then businesses can trust the legal system in both developed and developing nations. And I'll tell you, I am still advocating for mediation 15 years later. I know the IFC and the American Bar Association is still doing it. So my only comment is that, you know, this kind of work takes time, as all of you already know. Uh, but I appreciate the word uh, integrity, which was used. And this willingness to change needs to come from within, within people whether it's somebody as high up as the prime minister, or as the president, or as low as the janitor. So keeping integrity in mind and keeping the idea that advocacy takes time, but consistent advocacy is the way to go. Um, I am appreciative to each of you for contributing your thoughts today and your insights today. I have learned quite a bit, and uh, I am grateful. I hope uh, we stay in touch and continue this conversation because, like I said, this is not going to ha happen overnight. Uh, so thank you once again. We're going to end our session. 
but remain in touch and hopefully see you all at the next one. Thank you. Have a nice day. Bye. Thank you.